Why was SN15's flight delayed? Was the first flight on Mars successful? What's next with the mystery structure in Boca Chica? I'll answer this and many other questions in this episode of Space Updates. As always, we'll begin our news with a progress update regarding Starship prototypes. In the last episode, we left off with SN15, which just had its third Raptor installed. As a reminder, it arrived with SN61 and SN66 just to go back where it came from, to again come back to Boca Chica a day later. It was then mounted next to its brothers. Unfortunately, even though we've had a few road closures and a couple of notams, SpaceX still hasn't conducted a static fire, which is mandatory to perform a test flight. As always, it's probably a typical case of Elon time. Fortunately, it looks like this time the static fire should occur on Monday and the earliest possible flight date is no earlier than 27th of March. To cheer you up, I have two pieces of good news. The first one is that FAA is supposedly really close to giving the SN15s its flight approval. And the second one is that workers finally mounted the missing heat tiles, so right now we have an almost perfect rectangle and the perfectionist can breathe a sigh of relief. Also as a side note, it looks like SN15 has a secret message related to our favorite Doge located under one of her forward flaps. Please just buy some Doge coins. SN16 is getting really close to being finished. Not that long ago, the common section was stacked, and now it was joined by the prototype's aft section. With a bit of luck, or bad luck in case of delays, we could again see two starships standing at their test stands at the same time. Hopefully, this time no one will be stupid enough to look under the starship's skirt, or at least, if they do, they've been warned about the potential loose raptors. Do you think that those raptors bite like normal dogs? Or maybe their special attack is exploding their turbo pump? Next up, we have our mystery construction, which isn't really a mystery anymore. One SpaceX worker decided that it would be a good idea to take a photo from the top of this weird nose cone. He must have realized his mistake really fast, because after a few minutes his tweet vanished. Fortunately, you know, you can't really delete something from the internet, so that's why you see this photo right now. He also has confirmed that yes, it is a test stand to check whether the nose cone is capable of withstanding the pretty high g-forces during its first orbital flight. It looks like this test isn't safe enough to conduct it in the production facility, and that's why this contraption was moved to the testing facility. This week, we've had a ton of rollouts. Even before the mystery structure rollout, the GSC-2 tank was transported and mounted near the orbital launch pad. In the future, it will be used to hold an enormous amount of liquid oxygen. The GSC-3 tank is almost ready and in the end we should see from 6 to 8 those tanks mounted near the OLP. Other than that, the brand new SpaceX Mega Crane, also called by some as Kong or Rezilla, was transported near the production facility, where it will be used to help with the construction of the orbital launch tower. Speaking of orbital launch towers, how's the progress regarding the OLP? Well, as you probably can guess, the progress is really, but I mean really rapid. Right now, the orbital launch mount received a kind of mounting hardware that will allow for the launch table to be placed on top of the white pillars. OEBL decided to visualize this process in one of his animations. The launch tower itself has also got a significant upgrade. Right now, all four metal pillars were mounted on top of the concrete base. Mauricio also spotted the hardware needed to mass produce parts of the launch towers. This means that SpaceX is working really smart right from the beginning. I can't wait to see this enormous tower fully erected. It is also worth mentioning that the debris barrier that will separate the orbital launch pad from the landing pad is also being built right now. To end up our Starship section of this video, we have a really weird test part. It's a thrust dome for the prototype named B2.1. Yes, you're hearing right, B2.1. The first thing that comes into my mind is of course booster, but the N is missing, so it could be the same naming system as the Starship test tanks. 
for example SN7.1 or SN7.2. What supports this theory is that it looks like this dome doesn't have a way to attach engines onto it. Maybe this tank will be used to test out some kind of technology used in the new prototypes of Super Heavy. We'll probably know shortly. Before we continue, I want to ask you to subscribe to my channel so you'll never miss out on any of my Starship videos. As you can see, a huge portion of you isn't subscribed, so please help me change the statistic. If you're also here, then don't forget to drop a like and leave your opinion in the comments. Anyway, back to the video. I've decided that sometimes I'll include a couple of news from other companies than SpaceX. So that's why we'll start with the SpaceX's Crew 2 mission. At the time of recording this video, the crew already docked to the station and was transferred on board. This mission had one day of delay that was caused by unfavorable weather conditions. Fortunately, on Friday the weather looked good enough so that the mission could start without any risk. It was a really special mission because of two things. The first one being that it was another flight to the International Space Station conducted under the NASA Commercial Crew Program. Secondly, during this mission, the booster B-1061 and the Crew Dragon Endeavour capsule were already flown before, which means that the astronauts were transported by a fully reused rocket. Shane Kimbrew, Catherine Megan MacArthur, Ahiko Hoshide and Thomas Pesquet will stay on board of the ISS for about 180 days, during which they will conduct all sorts of research and experiments. As a side note, right now there are 11 people on board the ISS, which is really close to the previous record of 13 crew members. Speaking of ISS, it looks like Russia is planning to get out from the space station to migrate to their own station before the end of 2025. It's kind of surprising, especially that their module called Nauka will be docked to the ISS later this year. Which doesn't give them too much time to play with it. Of course, Roscosmos leaving ISS doesn't mean that it will be abandoned or shut down, but it is a step in the direction of the ISS inevitable death. We need to remember that it's over 20 years old. The supposed cause of leaving the ISS by Russia is that it has too many issues and is wasting too much annual budget, where for the same price they could just sustain their own space station. It will be built by the Energia company, which built the aforementioned Nauka module. First cosmonauts should dock to the station with Soyuz by the end of 2025. Also, in 2025, we'll have a really interesting situation in space where there will be a total of 5 active space stations orbiting different bodies. The first one is obviously the International Space Station. Next, we have the aforementioned Russian Orbital Station. Then, there's the Chinese Space Station, which first module called Tianhe will be launched on the Long March 5B as early as April 29th. There will be also the Gateway, which first two modules called PPE and Halo will be carried to the lunar orbit using Falcon Heavy in May of 2024. And finally, we'll have the first private space station owned by the Axiom Space. In the first phase, it will be connected to the ISS, but near the year 2030, it should undock from the ISS and be fully autonomous with at least one astronaut at all times. So in a few years, it will get really crowded in space. To end this episode, let's go to Mars, where a few incredible things were achieved. Firstly, we have the first ever autonomous flight on the other planet using propellers. You could compare it to the first Wright Brothers flight. The Ingenuity helicopter went to an altitude of about 3 meters, which gave us about 39.1 seconds in the air. The whole thing was recorded by the cameras located on the Perseverance rover, but from the drone itself, we've only seen a one picture. Later, we should get more of those and maybe in the future we'll even get the video. Three days later, the helicopter was flown for the second time. This time, the flight took 51.9 seconds and during this test, the drone went to 5 meters of altitude and then tilted 5 degrees, which allowed him to fly sideways a whole 2 meters. Here, everything also looked nominal, which gave the green light for another more extreme test. But that's not all that happened on Mars this week. It turns out that one of the most interesting science experiments located on the Perseverance rover, which is MOXIE, was able to convert the carbon dioxide located in the Mars atmosphere into 5 grams of breathable oxygen. All of that happened during the 16th Sol, and according to NASA, this amount of oxygen would allow the astronaut to survive about 10 minutes on the Red Planet. 
In the end, Moxie should be able to generate a max of 10 grams of oxygen per hour, which demonstrates the incredible technology that could be later used to allow fist Martians to generate air and maybe even rocket fuel. Who knows what else we'll get from the Perseverance rover. That's all I've got for you in this episode of Space Updates. As always, if you like this video, then don't forget to subscribe, leave a like, comment, and I guess I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.